in a church, everything kind of uh, operates out of a calendar, out of a planner. They kind of run our lives, don't they? They're helpful, but if you're not careful, they become your king. They, they will ab- absolutely burn you out putting things on a calendar. And trying to live your life according to a calendar. I have, I keep two. I'm, I'm such a glutton for punishment. I keep two. I've, I've got this big one here, and it's got a, you know, it's got a monthly thing here where I can see what's going on every month. But then every day I keep a journal of what I'm doing and what's supposed to be going on. And, and in a church, when you start making plans, you come up with an idea, you put it on the calendar, and then that kind of dictates how you operate that day or that week or that month. Uh, they. You've heard that term before, burnout, haven't you? Burnout? I'm not talking about what Jason's doing in his charger out here on the road. I'm talking a lot about uh, what happens to us as we uh, go through life. We just get to the point where um, we're just burnt out. You know, it doesn't take a lot of effort to burn out in ministry. Uh, All the articles that I've been reading the last month or two, all have this same theme that there is burnout happening to pastors in the ministry. The stress of ministry can be unrelenting. Pastors are leaving the ministry at an alarming rate. Uh, have you ever heard of Barner Research? Barner Research recently did a, a survey of pastors in America, and 42% of pastors in America right this very moment, are considering leaving the ministry, 42% of them. In fact, they, they came back and then said, okay, let's see how many of them would actually say that they are in a healthy space. And that was only 35% of America's pastors that fell into that category of healthy. Um, you know, the biggest reason? Stress. The stress of the job. Pastors write articles, and you're in my shoes, you read articles all the time from other pastors, and, and they're talking about how they're overwhelmed, they're overworked, they're overcommitted, um, their churches are shrinking. Um, COVID really did a number on the church and on pastors serving. And so there's, there's this thing that's happening within the church that pastors at alarming rate, are walking away from behind the pulpit. And so that being said, it's been fun. <laughs> no, stress, you know, stress is true. Uh, no matter if you're a pastor or you're a baker, you can be a, a CEO of a Fortune 500 company or a stay-at-home mom. You, you could be the president of the United States or the president of the PTA. You could be a judge, a lawyer, a police officer, stress is real, burnout is real. In a recent study of 7,500 Americans, more than 70 of those adults in this age range of 20s and 30-year-olds, 70% of 20 and 30-year-olds, that's you, Ben, say they are on the verge of burnout. Well, you know what that means? By the time they get my age, they're just going to be crispy on the ground. There ain't going to be nothing left of them. They need to go to their safe space, I guess. You know, I don't know. But that means, um, and I, well, I guess what it means for people their age, those people in the 20s and 30s, is this. It don't get any better. It just gets harder. It gets worse. When, when you get my age, there's not going to be anything left of you. And, and, and I really, all this just means that you know, we're all stressed out, and we've got no place to go. Do you feel that way? Uh, maybe, maybe it's just me. I don't know. You know, our, our day timers, our calendars, our schedules uh, are packed full. Anybody wish you had more hours in a day? That, that, that you just look at what you've got to do, and, and, and you just 
I just need more hours in a day. Here's the, here's the thing. If you really sat down and looked at your calendar, a lot of those things that are filling up those time slots are mundane, unimportant things. We, we have this incredible capacity to allow our schedules to just be filled, just add another little thing, of just something that's not important. And, and those schedules then begin to dictate the quality of our life when we, I mean, we want to, if it's on there, we want to get it done, right? Or we want to put it on there. I mean, there's good stuff on there too. Stuff that really matters. Stuff that's important. Stuff that, but w- anybody have trouble saying no? Or anybody like that? I feel like I'm talking to myself today. I don't know. I mean, we, we want to take advantage of every opportunity that comes our way. We want to assist people, help people. Um, but what happens is we end up trying to do more than God intended for us to do. You think God intended for my day planner to just be absolutely full every 15-minute slot? No wonder we're a country that's tired and run down. You know, uh, I, I'm not trying to get any sympathy because here's what we know is that everybody has stress. Every single one of us have stress. It's just a normal part of life. You can feel stress in your body when you have too much to do or maybe you didn't get enough sleep. Those things create stress in our life. But you can also have stress when you begin to sit down and think about your job or you begin to think about how much money I got or don't have in the bank. Stress comes from thinking about our relationships or our children's relationships. Maybe you have a family or a friend that is ill or has a health crisis or, or they're spending time in a hospital. That creates a lot of stress. I've, over the years here, had many people in this congregation that I love creates a lot of stress whenever I know somebody's in, in the hospital and I can't do anything for them. And, and in response to stress, you understand how your body responds to stress. Your blood pressure increases. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'd like to know how many of you all are on blood pressure medicine. That, don't raise your hand. I'm not looking to embarrass you. <laughs> don't point at her either, okay? That's not cool. You know, when you get stressed out, your heart rate increases. Every morning, I check my heart rate. I've got one of those, I'm a geek, you know. I've got one of those scales that it hooks up to my phone. I stand on it, and I really do it backwards because whenever I stand on it, it tells me my weight. Well, the next thing that I do is I check my heart rate. I should really check my heart rate before I check my weight (laughs) because checking my weight just leads my heart to speed up. But... Heart rate increases, our respiration changes, our metabolism changes, the blood flow to our muscles increased. You know why that happens, don't you? I mean, that's a natural response because human beings uh, need to be able to react quickly and effectively in high-pressure situations. And when stress is on, that's what your body does. But imagine the toll it takes on your body when that happens Day after day after day, or hour after hour after hour. I mean, if you're constantly reacting to stressful situations and you never make any adjustments to counter those stressors, your health and well-being is at risk. You're going to find yourself laying in a hospital bed or in a straitjacket right next to me, okay? But here's where wisdom comes in. You know, that's what we've been talking about the last three weeks is wisdom. We've been looking in the book of Proverbs about what it means to have wisdom and what it means to be wise. Wisdom comes into the game here, and it has a huge part to play in reducing or eliminating the stress of our daily lives because wise people know this. If you want to take notes, it's on the back. Wise people know that you have to have your priorities in line. That's what wise people know. Proverbs 17, 24. I think I've got it up here. This is out of the Good News Translation. I'll use this one. I kind of like how it says it. The Good News Translation says, An intelligent person, which 
you know, synonymous with wise. An intelligent person aims at wise action, but a fool starts in many directions. So here, here's my paraphrase. A wise man has his priorities in order and begins on that path. A fool, he just scatters a hundred different ways just looking to figure out something. You know, I, some people might say, oh, Jason, here's how you say that. They have too many irons in the fire. Well, that's right up my alley because, you know, I'm a TV buff, and I've been watching, what is the name of that show? It's uh, Forged in Fire. It's on Netflix. Have you seen that? Where those guys take these pieces of metal, and, and they put them in the forge, and they heat them up, and then they take them over to an anvil or a press, and then they make a knife out of them. Have you seen that? Janelle, and she'll back me up. So she's like, why do you watch that stupid show? And then the other day, she was like, oh, what are they doing now? She like, I'm like, hook, all right, she's on. But in, that, having too many irons in the fire, that is a, an old blacksmithing terminology dating back to the 1500s. See, a blacksmith, he's got his fire going, and he heats the piece of metal in the fire. And as it heats, that makes it malleable, or malleable, I guess, if you're from up north. But you put it in, and then you can smash it into the shape that you want. Too many irons in the fire means that the fire is cooled down because it's trying to heat too many things up at the, at the same time. That's what it means to have too many irons in the fire is that someone is attempting to do too many things at once. It means that someone has divided their time between too many activities and what ultimately happens is nothing gets done well. You, you become inefficient and unfocused. You know, we are stressed to the max because we pay too much things to things that are insignificant. Too many, we pay too much attention to things that are ineffective or insignificant or unimportant. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that's a foolish thing to do. Proverbs 12, 11 says this, Those who waste their time on worthless projects are foolish. Too many irons in the fire. Doing things that don't matter, things that are mundane. Here's what wise people do. Wise people decide what is truly important, and those are the things that they focus on. They evaluate every task, they evaluate every project, and, and, that, and if that task and that project or that event is useless or unimportant, they jettison it. It's, I mean, they just white it out. Because wise people ask, is this a request? Is this something that is just kind of somebody needs something that they're asking? Is it urgent? Wise people will say that. Is this urgent? Wise people say, is this uh, important? Is, really, is this a matter of extreme importance? Like, is this a matter of life or death? And, and those things that don't, don't meet their criteria, they get them off. They trash them. They throw them in the bin. They... They keep the main thing the main thing. That's what wise people do. Um, we've got any puzzle putters together. Is that, what would you call it, puzzlers? I don't know the term. People who like to put puzzles together. Anybody like that in here? Okay. You know, you get those. My, my mother-in-law loves to put puzzles together. She'll get like 500 pieces or 1,000 pieces, and nobody will be able to eat for like a month because it's all over the dining room table. Okay. But you know what people who do puzzles do first? Do they just kind of go through the box and just try to just take a piece and try to put it together? No. If you've ever done a puzzle, you know the proper way to do it is you get all the edges out, right? You pull all the edge pieces out. And then you start putting the edge together. Nobody starts in the middle of the puzzle and tries to put it together. That's not how you do that. You have to prioritize finding the edge in the corner pieces. That's how you do it effectively. I mean, if you just dig around in that puzzle, just hoping that you're going to find two pieces that put together, you're going to be there forever. You're never going to get anything accomplished. Wise people have priorities. They know the proper order things should go in. Wise people think through the direction of their life. They clarify their personal values. 
And then they set goals or objectives according to those values. Then, once they've got the values and the objectives together, these things right here, these calendars, they, those things are prioritized amongst things that are actually of value, importance, that make a difference, that, that fall in line with the purpose of their life. They make sure that everything's in harmony. They don't just go off a hundred different ways. I can tell you this. I'll promise you this. You can live your life one of two ways. You can live your life either by your priorities or by your pressures. It doesn't matter. Take your pick. One of those things is going to control you. But wise people know that my priorities always trump my pressures. I order my life according to what is important to me, not what is important to you, and then you pressuring me. If you don't set your agenda, someone else will. I promise you that. And let me also say this. You don't have to catch every ball that's thrown at you. Think, let that sink in for just a second. As human beings, I know we have this urgency or this tendency that no matter what is thrown at us, we want to catch it, we want to deal with it, we want to solve it, and then we want to toss it back. But be wise enough to see the ball that's thrown at you and whether or not it's worthwhile to catch that ball. If you've established your priorities in life, you're in a better position whenever that ball comes at you that you don't need to catch. And it may be a good thing. But catching every ball that's thrown your way will only add to the stress of your life as you're catching them and dealing with them while another one's coming at you. Remember, you don't have to catch every ball. That is an effective way to reduce the stress in your life. I want to ask you, just consider this before I move on to the next point. Do you know what is important in your life? Do you have your priorities arranged? Have you ever written out your life objective? Have you ever sat back and considered what I truly value and what I'm willing to take on and what are some things that come my way that I really don't need to be messing with? Wise people take the time to address their priorities and arrange their schedules accordingly. Number two, so we've dealt with the schedule or the priorities. The sixth thing you need to do is as you're going through your daily schedule, you need to lighten your attitude. I mean, I mean, have you ever noticed how people today get angry and frustrated and uptight about virtually everything? I might not want to ask that question because there might be some of you all in here, right? Well, some of you may be that way. I mean, do you get frustrated, uptight, anxious because you're five minutes late? Or maybe someone else is five minutes late. You get angry, frustrated, uptight when you have to check your own groceries at Walmart. Oh, now I'm hitting a little closer to home, right? Chill out. It's not the end of the world. You get angry, frustrated, upset, anxious when a coworker doesn't do their job the way that you think it needs to be done. You get angry, uptight, frustrated when you have to pay a bill? <laughs> yeah, of course. And a lot of you get angry, uptight, frustrated, anxious because of social media. You know why? Because you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook, or you're on Instagram, or something like that, and you'll get uptight because you'll read someone else's hot take. You know what a hot take is, old people? A hot take is when somebody shares an opinion that's not widely accepted. Like, Kirk Herbstreet yesterday had the hot take that Cincinnati was going to beat the Razorback, okay? I read that and I was all upset, man. How dare he? We're seven-point favorites at home, right? But that's what happens. We get on the phone. We look at that hot take and we lose it. Sometimes we lose it when people just make honest mistakes. But what happens? I mean, the bottom line is we lose perspective. 
over everything, and we get stressed out at the smallest little things. Stress is not an event. Stress is an attitude. It's a response. It's an emotional response to whatever's happening. You, have you ever noticed this, that two people, take two people, can respond completely different to the same event? I know there's things in our work, me and Ben, that happen that I will spin sideways and Ben's like, what are you getting upset for? You know, It's like no big deal. When you start to see every situation, every event that is a crisis that rises and falls on your shoulders, that's when we experience stress. You know what that does? Proverbs 7, or 12, 25 says, anxiety weighs down the heart. It's like a boat anchor, ain't it? You start feeling the pressures of performance that all this rests on my shoulders. If I don't get it done, the world is going to come to a screeching halt on its axis. People are going to fall over because the world's no longer spinning. I mean, if you're one of those who gets stressed out so easily, it's time to admit you got a problem. Take a chill pill, like the kids used to say, right? They have those too. They're pretty effective. But you've got to be able to see that your own stress, any stress you have, is largely your own fault. It's, it's, your stress is largely of your own creation. It's composed of the way you've set up your life and the way you react to it. You know, the Bible says that fools get all worked up about things. But fools get all worked up about things that when you begin to look at them a little closer, it's not that big a deal. I, I've been foolish like that. I've gotten worked up about things that aren't important. Fools get worked up and, and anxious about little problems and concerns, and they take them and they blow them all out of proportion like they're the biggest deal on the planet. You know, a better solution is to, is to have the wisdom, is to seek the wisdom from God, ask Him for wisdom, and then with that wisdom, be aware of your emotional responses to the circumstances of life. Stop taking yourself so seriously. Stop thinking that everything rises and falls on your performance. Now, I am a card-carrying melancholy. And if you know anything about the personality types in a melancholy, Nothing in the world exists except problems. And anxiety and me are best friends. But you have to stop taking yourself so seriously. When you fail, give yourself a break. Did you know that the best batters in the major league are barely hitting 300? Why do you expect yourself to bat 1,000 every time? Don't get all worked up and stressed out and anxious when things don't go your way. Don't get stressed out when you forget to do something. Don't get stressed out when someone else doesn't meet your expectations. All those things are minor annoyances that you allow to become major points of anxiety. And then everybody else in your wake suffers. So what I'd like you to do is kind of practice this is actually Rick Warren tells, talks about this. He says, practice relaxed concern. Not yoga. That's not relaxed concern. That's not what I'm talking about. But it's this attitude that says, yes, I want the best, but I realize that we're all just human and stuff happens. I'm sure you've probably seen that. I, I came across this church slogan. It's an old one, but it, I come across it this week, and it just reminded me. You know, there's a church slogan that people have used that says, I'm not okay, you're not okay, and that's okay. Be aware that things don't always go as you expect them to go. Proverbs 16.9 says, We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. And ultimately, you need to realize that the Lord is in control of your life. Proverbs 14.30 says, A relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. Remember all those things I told about blood pressure and, and, and getting your metabolism all worked up and all that? A relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. It's healthy for us to respond this way. So we need to keep life in perspective. 
in the big scheme of things, here's what wis- uh, that Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes. I came across this, I love it. Wi- this is what Solomon says, no one will remember what we're doing now. I mean, seriously, in a hundred years, you think anybody's going to remember some of the things that you get worked up about in a day? No. Nobody, nobody has a camera on your life watching your response to the mundane things of life, and then in a hundred years, they're going to sit back and put it on television and everybody laugh at you. That's not happening. Third thing, last thing, keep your eyes on the Lord. You know, stress should actually uh, serve as a warning light on the dash of life. And if you're wise, you'll heed that warning light. My kid gets a warning light on his dash. He thinks it's just a Christmas ornament. Okay? That it's, I'm going, it's telling you something. It means there's a problem. So that's what stress is. It's a warning that our priorities are out of whack. And here's where we're circling back around. We talked earlier about getting your priorities in line. Your priority, your only priority. No other priorities. People used to say, you know, God, family. Here's the thing. It's no, there's no priorities. It's God. Stress is a warning that you have taken your eyes off of the Lord. You have taken your eyes off the Lord and you started prioritizing other things in life that do not matter. You can, you, you, can, you can absolutely avoid the circumstances and consequences of a stressed out life by readjusting your focus. Here's what I know about you, here's what I know about me, that we like to dwell on trouble. I'm talking mentally. We like to, we like to chew it up, like, like troubles are, are a cow or something that we're just sitting there chewing it and chewing it and chewing it. We like to chew up and think about and dwell on our circumstances. We like to think about bad decisions that we've made in the past. We like to think about our own failures, our own inadequacies, our own weaknesses. We like to focus and dwell and think about our unmet expectations in life. I needed it to go like this, and it's only going like this, and I'm all bulled up and mad and stressed out at life. Here's what the Scriptures say. Don't dwell on those things. Dwell on the Lord. The Bible addresses how we can avoid the unhealthy consequences of stress. It says this in Proverbs 10, 27. Respect for the Lord will add years to your life. And you know what it means when it says respect the Lord, right? That means that you take God seriously. That He's not an afterthought. He's not a quick fix solution. He's not a last resort. He is not even at the top of our priorities. He is everything. Do you live that way? Do you live that way as though everything is about Jesus and it's not about, did I miss that parking spot? Or did I forget to turn that spreadsheet in? You know, when you come to the point where you can actually wrap your brain around this idea that, that God is everything, what happens is He becomes the source of your confidence. Proverbs fourteen twenty six says this, In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. Anxiety is the opposite. Anxiety is you telling your brain you have no confidence that this is going to turn out the way it needs to turn out. But it says that fearing the Lord, which is really not like fear, ah, it's like respect, right? Respect of the Lord, one has strong confidence. Proverbs 14, 26 of the Living Bible says this, reverence for God gives a man deep strength. So how do you keep your eye on the Lord? That's a whole other sermon. But I'll give you a little synopsis, you know, because wise people, they develop this habit of finding solitude. They develop this habit of getting alone with God. That's, I mean, that's what Jesus did. 
You know, when Jesus was the most pressured in his ministry, when people were, were, were following him and wanting him to perform great miracles, you know what he would do when, he, when he'd reach that point of, of burnout? He'd go and get alone. And the disciples, they was all looking around for him. Where's he at? You know, we got people waiting here to be healed. And Jesus would say, nope, here's my priorities. Those are good things. We'll get to those. But I've got to go and be alone with my Father first. And if you are sitting here, and I'm telling you this, I'm saying have a daily quiet time. Have a daily time where you get alone with the Lord and His Word. And if you don't have time in your schedule to get alone with the, wor- the Lord and His Word, you are too busy. We need to go back to number one. We need to talk about getting those things off your schedule, okay? But it takes discipline, and you have to be intentional. You just don't take time. You make time. Seeking solitude, opening God's Word, spending time in prayer. You see that as, if I, if I add that to my calendar, I'm going to be even more stressed out than I am today. The secret is that when you do those things, it's actually a, a great way to decompress, to relieve stress, to de-stress. And I promise you, every time you come in contact with the Lord through His Word, you will be changed. When you come to that place where He is everything and and you can't sustain life without spending time with Him, you will be changed. You know why? We have this, human beings have this odd habit of becoming like the people you hang out with. Have you ever noticed that? Ben, I I see myself and Ben all the time. You know why? Because we're, we're spending a lot of time together. That's what happens. If you're spending time with the Lord every single day, you will be changed. You'll begin to see the Lord from His viewpoint. You'll begin to see the world from His viewpoint. And you'll begin to see how you're not really in control to begin with. And you'll begin to understand that not everything depends on you and your performance. And through that whole process, you'll learn to develop a deep trust in the Lord. That's what trust is. Trust is just being, being able to experience that every day what this person tells me is working out and coming true and I get to trust them more and more. It's consistency. It's experience. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, of course, you, I wouldn't do a sermon on Proverbs without this verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all you do and He will show you with patch, with, which path to take. You know what? Knowing that everything doesn't depend on you and that God is willing to be in charge, uh, that should remove every ounce of stress and anxiety that you have about having to make the correct call, having to be right on every decision, or that you have to perform to a certain level. When you come to that point and you realize that God is willing to take all those responsibilities on Himself. Hey, Here's what I want you to do. I'll let you get out of here. It's Labor Day. Somebody's probably wanting to go fishing. Someday, when you're at home, and all there is is reruns of Wheel of Fortune, sit down and write out everything you did that day. If you can remember it, write out everything you did, every single thing. And then go back and evaluate each item on that list as to their importance. Ask yourself, was this urgent? Ask yourself, was this essential? Was this important? Was this helpful, but not necessary? Or was this trivial? And when I think what you're going to notice is that you're spending a lot of time on things that don't matter, on unnecessary stuff. You'll see that many of the things that you took on don't match up with your personal values and your goals, and, and that somehow where, somewhere along the lines your priorities have got out of whack. Jesus told us two secrets. Two secrets to avoiding the stress of of, of this life, and both of them require Him being a part of the process. And here's the first one. It's it's out of Matthew 11, 28. This great one for Labor Day. 
Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. That's secret one. Come to me. Bring your worries. Bring your anxieties. Bring this performance issue. Bring your calendar to me. Put it on me, and then rest. That's what Labor Day is. We're supposed to take a day of rest, right? Jesus is saying every single day should be Labor Day for you. In the second secret, he says in Matthew 6, 33, he says, seek the kingdom of God above all else. He's talking about priorities. Seek the kingdom of God about all, above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. You don't have to work trying to think that I've got to do this so that I'll have what I need. You say, Jesus first, and he's going to give me everything I need. It's a de-stressor. It removes the anxiety. Because at the end of the day, you're, when you stand before God, he's not going to ask you, did, did you get all those tasks done that you put on your calendar? He's not going to ask you, did you finish that spreadsheet your boss asked you to do? He's not going to ask you, did you really work as hard as you could for that promotion? He's not going to even ask you, where'd you go to church? What denomination were you a part of? You see, he's going to ask you one question when you stand before him, and it's going to be, what did you do with my son Jesus? That's the only question he's going to ask. That's all he cares about. If, if that's all he cares about, he's the creator of the universe, why are we sitting around worrying and, 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 and rubbing our hands and, and getting all worked up about the, you know, the dog kennel not being cleaned or whatever? Why, why do that? He's going to ask you one question. And I, the, the part of this, uh, you know, I cheated a couple times in school. I'm sorry. Don't look at me like that. You guys did too. But I'm going to give you a little, you know, you used to write, have a little cheat sheet or write an answer on your hand if you had trouble remembering it. There's only one answer when he stands in front of you and says, what did you do with my son Jesus? The only acceptable approved answer that is going to determine your eternal destiny that he wants to hear is, he's my Lord and Savior. That's it. And so in the big scheme of things, why do we spend so much time and energy on things that are not of eternal value? Get your priorities straight. Make Christ the Lord of your life and spend time with Him daily. He isn't just the priority of your life. He should be the only thing you focus on. And I promise you, everything will be okay from that point on. Let's pray. Lord, we stand before you just saying, unequivocally, you are a good God. And Lord, you are our strength. You are the source of, of our wisdom. Lord, but we admit that we, uh, we're, we're fallen, we're broken. We have a tendency to get things out of whack. We have a tendency to look inward for solutions to our problems. We have a tendency to say things that shouldn't be said. We, we have a tendency just to get all worked up about mundane insignificant things. And so this morning, Lord, I just pray that at this point that we're all just, just recalibrating our view of you and of how to properly live life. You have designed this life with a purpose. And, and there is absolutely structure to it. And there is a way that you intended for us to live. But in our sinful, broken state, we have got it wrong time after time after time. And in that, we sit around and worry and fret and get all bent out of shape trying to figure out why, where we went wrong. And so, Father, we're just here this morning just saying, would you just recalibrate our hearts? Would you just make us aware? Would you quicken our spirits of where, where we need to make adjustments? And then, Lord, I pray that you give us the strength and, and, and the people that will hold us accountable just to get on that right path and make it right. Because it all matters to you and not to us. Your son is everything.
and we give him praise, glory, and honor for it's in Christ that we pray. Amen. Hi, thank you for watching. If you want to see more great content like this, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to ring the little bell to be notified when we add new videos. Since our founding in 1877, our goal here at Arnhart has been to create God-centered teaching available for everyone, regardless of their status or station. Today, that looks like making trustworthy Bible teaching available to everyone even if they don't make it to a church building on Sunday. So for more information, check out our website at arnhart.org or join us live on Facebook Sundays at 1045 a.m. As always, we love you and hope to see you next Sunday.